about five and a half months out from the next Senate election. Let's predict how the 2024 class will be elected one by one. Let's go. First and foremost, here I have what I'd bet my parents' life savings on. These states will definitely go for each other's party 100%. Now, this is the floor. The Republicans are working with about 47 seats, and the Democrats are starting out with 38. 2018 was a big red wave despite a blue midterm overall in the Congress and the House of Representatives, but yet the Senate was really good because they had the same map as it is presented now on screen. The 24 map basically for lack of a better explanation cycles in and so we have a 2020 map a 22 a 24 and 24 coalesces with 2018 and so therefore we're going to have a really advantageous result for the republicans even if they lose the popular vote here's why as you can see here while the republicans flipped like three or four seats in 2018 in that midterm y'all will notice that the popular vote overall for these uh, Senate and congressional elections was a net positive for Democrats in the order of about 8.6%. And they still won the Senate, which is remarkable, which shows that the Senate results are really favored towards the states that are really Republican. As you can see, a lot of these states are going to be favorable to the GOP. States now like West Virginia, Ohio, Florida, Texas, Arizona, these states would have been more in contention in 2012 and it would have been more competitive. But it's very clear that the Republicans can lose the congressional vote by a lot and still win the Senate regardless, especially when Donald Trump, let's say, wins the election in 24 and we have a vice presidential candidate in whoever it is breaking the ties in the Senate. So keeping that in mind, I think it's going to be north of 51, but let's get right into the facts. So first of all, we have to hit the first first state and I think it's going to be Maine. I think we're going to give this one to the Democrats for a couple of different reasons. Okay. When we look at Maine, first of all, there is no polling on Maine. When it comes to 538, there is nothing of the sort. It kind of shows that the Republicans are not contesting this. How contested will, would you ask? Because it, it is a state. People ought to care about Maine. Let's look at the Republican Party today. When we look at it, in 2018, at least the last time there was an election, Angus King, who is a left-to-center independent, not as crazy as uh, Bernie Sanders, who's technically also an independent, but most certainly an insane person, okay? Angus King got 54% of the vote to Eric Brakey's 35%. So much like his receding hairline, his support died really quickly close to the election today. And by the way, we had Zach Regelstein also getting about 10%, which shows that despite not getting all uh, of the Democrat vote, he got more than a fair share of virtually all the independents in the state of Maine, beyond also like 10-ish percent of the Republican share of the vote as well. And so that shows that Angus King is really strong and that he won the last election in 2018 by about 20. And so it's a big ask for him to lose in 24. Now, granted, it's basically a Democrat W at that point. Now, some counterpoints would include that Susan Collins is certainly is a really big middle finger to my whole point. But I would counterpoint that by saying, and to really rebuttal it, I would begin to say that Suzanne Collins has a similar appeal to Amy Klobuchar and that I'll explain it when I get to uh, Minnesota. But for now, let's leave this blue. Okay, so now it's 39 to 47. Now, even more bad news for the Republicans. I actually think Minnesota is also going safe blue uh, in the Senate level. The reason being is, of course, now, of course, look at this. Amy Klobuchar won the state of Minnesota that Trump lost by only 1.5% in 2016 by of order of magnitude. In fact, she won it by about 24% in 2018, a year that was a wave year for Republicans at the Senate level, yet she outperformed by about 20-ish percentage points. Utterly insane. Now, let's back at the last election. Again, she won that by 35% in a year where Romney lost by less than about 10, okay? Now, even looking past that, 2006, she won this election by 21. Why is that huge? Of course, let's look at the same state in the same year. Tim Walls, who's also a similar vein of like left to center Democrat. And we look at Tim Walls beating this Republican, Jeff Johnson, that I bet you none of you know who that is. He beat him by about 11 percentage points in 2018. Now, that is still about less than half of the margin of victory for Amy Klobuchar in 2018, which shows that she's bound to outperform Biden by about 15 to 20 percentage points in an off year. With Trump on the ballot, you could say that Amy Klobuchar wins by like maybe 11 or something, but it definitely shows that it's going blue and it kind of is indicative that there's no polling on this, by the way, because Republicans are not wasting their money on that. Moving on to the state of New Mexico, this is one's looking really bad. Of course, we have the Demonici uh, descendant. She goes by the name of Nella. Now, if Ken, the Dominici family in the Southwest has been really prominent around Arizona, New Mexico, etc., for maybe three or so decades. The truth is, though, is that despite an outperformance likely to happen here, the state voted 10 plus points for Biden in 2020. And while it may be a lot closer in 24, it does not mean by any means that Martin Heinrich, who is a more popular person than is Joe Biden, 
will lose the Senate race. And so I think that's a blue state. When you really look at it on one hand, just to get real for a second, when you look at it in one hand, like I just said, you'll notice that the funding priorities are a certain way and you got to really recognize this. So for example, in Maine, Republicans aren't even trying. Therefore, it's a blue state, obviously. Uh, Minnesota, same thing. Let's look at New Mexico where it's a little more possible for there to be a flip. Martin Heinrich has raised about $8.5 million in this election, despite it being a pretty safe blue race. Whereas Nila Dominici, who is supposed to be a pretty strong candidate pound for pound as a Republican, has only gained about a fifth of that amount. In fact, she's only gained $1.1 million. It's really just a fraction of what's going on here. And of the sparse polling that we have gotten, we've gotten all safety remarks. And so that is to say, of course, that the state's most likely going blue. As unfortunate as a lot of people in New Mexico would have that being for them. So that's staying blue. But on the contrary, we can have another blue state too. And that's also going to be uh, Maryland. Now, Maryland is going to go blue, most certainly, and a lot of people are going to be really, really ticked off that I say this, as I even forgot to mention it in my last video for the Senate. But to be completely honest, when we look at this upcoming election in Maryland, you can see that Angela Alsobrooks, while not being the strongest candidate, is also a Democrat in a state that basically went Democrat by a metric crap ton in the last election. In fact, when we look at 2018, we see that Ben Cardin, who was at the time a 74-year-old charisma-less vacuum of a human being, beating this guy, Tony Campbell, by about 35 percentage points, which is to indicate that the thing is not competitive at all. And again, we saw Maryland go R plus 10 when it came to the gubernatorial level about six years ago uh, at the face of Larry Hogan's election prospect. That being said, though, that's not indicative at all of a concordance having to do with the general election result in the Senate. So I really do think that while Larry Hogan will make it closer than it usually is in Maryland, him losing by 10 is pretty much irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. If you got a random Republican to run and lost by 17, it really just isn't the biggest deal. I think he will lose. It's just a matter of fact. It really doesn't change the fact. Like, for example, let's say you had a uh, Democrat governor in Tennessee. Do you think they're going to win the Senate even if they're popular? And God forbid they were fat, obese, as well as also bald. Larry Hogan has a lot of things, again, uh, running against him. And that's a little bit too bad for him. But uh, it's kind of his own fault. But I recommend he move states. Now, granted, that might cause an earthquake moving on to maybe Virginia or West Virginia. But moving on to a state that's nearby, let's go to Virginia. Now, again, like I said before, the polling in and of itself is not really sufficient to get a really good breath as to what's going on here. That being said, from the little that we do know, we saw that even while Youngkin was the posited opponent in a theoretical race several months ago, you'll notice that as of last year, Youngkin was still losing to Tim Kaine. Now, the thing about Tim Kaine, of course, is that he's a guy who's good at fundraising, is a very standard Democrat, and was on Hillary's ticket in 2016. I only mention this to say that he's going to have the money to backstop any sort of backsliding for the Democrats in Virginia, namely his own race, of course. But even beyond this, of course, we also have uh, Hung Kao, who is really an unknown commodity. In the state of Virginia. In fact, he doesn't really have any sort of a national stage presence. He doesn't have this sort of like enthusiasm to drive up fundraising for him personally in a case where you do need that in the Senate level. Now, the polling for Virginia at the national level has not been too favorable for Trump. What I mean is that although he's making it closer than it was in the last presidential election, it's pretty clear that the thing has not really been uh, competitive at the state level, aside from that Duncan blip since like 2016 ish. And so it really doesn't make sense for Republicans at the national level at the Steve Dane, uh, you know, conference level to donate money from hardworking Americans to make Cal have a fighting chance here. And so it's very obvious he's going to lose. Um, because like I said, the funding is really good for the Democrats here. Tim Kaine is the perfect candidate. Again, very boring 60 something year old white guy. We love it over there in Virginia. So keep that in mind. I think that's going to be a pretty solid option for the Democrats, but moving on now to some red states. Okay, baby. All you people get excited. Okay. So now 47 to 43 Democrats looking like they're in prime position to maybe get a couple seats more, but I think it's pretty much doubtful. Now let's move on. West Virginia is the next state I want to talk about. Now, Jim Justice is poised to be the nominee, of course. And when you see a lack of polling for the Democrats, it just shows that they basically just gave up on the state entirely. So it's looking a lot like uh, Paris in 1941. I mean, it's just completely uh, bereft of any sort of defense at this point. It's just done. And mind you, it should have been 1940 that I said, but I'm developing a, uh, dementia at the old age of 21. So I got that mixed up. But moving on, we're going to go to, I think, Texas, which is going to be in line almost with Ohio's results, maybe. So let's just look into this right now. Now, if you look at it again, Texas is not really favorable to the Democrats for a couple of different reasons. Right now, polling has Trump up 
uh, in Texas over Biden more than he was over him four years ago when it went pretty solidly red, which is to say, of course, that the people that voted for Biden and the Democrats writ large over the past five years have been coming back home to the Trump plantation. And what that tells you, of course, is that when we were looking at the Trump support, it's also indicative that the vast majority of it in almost every circumstance will trickle down to the nominee of the down ballot races. In this case, Ted, uh, Lion Ted gets a big boost. In fact, he beats Allred in the most recent poll with a pretty big sample base, by the way by about 30 percentage points. That's very indicative that Colin Alred does not have the charisma of a beta work at the time. Again, mind you how that really uh, really screwed him up in 2019 when he ran for the presidency. Uh, it didn't really connect. And so we have a dollar store version of Kill, uh, uh, beta work when you really look at it. And we look at all these other polls when it was a lot closer and Cruz was still winning. And so I could bet a good, uh, good set him out of my limbs that Texas will go red at the Senate level in 2024. Now, this is somewhat promising, okay? Montana is certainly a state that people have been saying will go to test her, but let's look at the polling real quick. So first of all, we have a lot of primary polling, which is indicative that it's going to go Republican because if it were such a Democratic competitive state, then they would have equally spent money on the primary as well as the general election, even if it were a year ago they were conducting the polls. That being said, when we look at the uh, February cohort fresh off of this primary, we saw that a uh, different amount of different candidates were running here, whether that be Rosendale, Johnson, and Sheehy, all of them were losing by different amounts to uh, Tester. That being said, of course, what I predicted was going to happen has happened. In fact, when we look at the polling, as recently as about two months ago, Sheehy was winning by three. This is a state that Tester won decently in 2018 uh, off the back of, of uh, primarily the health care reform. And so when you're looking at that, that issue is pretty much to the wayside. Tester has nothing to run on now. He's going to say... What exactly? He's going to cooperate with Trump in the Senate? I doubt it. He doesn't have a record of doing such. And so for him to get any sort of like clientele that is mainly Republican, which is what you need in a state as safely Republican as the Buffalo chip state of Montana, then it's pretty indicative that he does not have the bona fides to have even a chance in hell of winning. And that's regardless of whether or not you have a Republican that's competent. All you need is a Republican with the pulse that says I will do whatever Trump says and stamp on that shit like a bad probation officer. And the truth is, is that it's going Republican no matter what anybody says. Let's move on to Florida. This is also looking really positive for the Republican Party. Again, the polls are all negative for the Democrats. In fact, you look at Florida writ large, it went super red in 22 went red in 2018. Again, we saw Gillum make it really close. This black guy strung out on crack or something with a prostitute, I think like six years ago. It was a bad look. Anyway, Andrew Gillum made it really close against Rhonda Robot DeSantis. There, that being said though, his strays aside, we have Scott, who is a very nominally basic Republican, which is basically what you need, by the way, in Florida, is ideally you're Hispanic, but if you're not cool doing coke at the clubs, you gotta be one of these straight white guys who can do these fundraisers in the villages, who can really... Just get it done. And so Tim Scott, and sorry, not Tim Scott, God forbid. No, 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 no. Rick Scott, the better. Okay. Tim, uh, Rick Scott has won a lot of elections very narrowly. Now, this was when it was a purple state, Florida, that is. The state is now solidified as red. He's going to have a ton of money, and there's no reason why Merskel Powell or whatever her pronunciation of the name is will make it even close. In fact, I think he'll win it by like eight or something like that. Very beautiful. Now, moving on to Ohio, this is the next closest one. Ohio is truly all over the place for the reason being that we do have most of the polling happening before the consequential primary we saw uh, several weeks ago. That being said, of course, that's not really indicative of what's going to happen. If any of y'all think that Brown has a chance of winning by 12, I need whatever crack you're doing. And I'm joking. But the point is, is that, of course, it's not even going to be close. That being said, of course, it's important to keep in mind what the dynamics of the race are. You have a guy in Sherrod Brown who has outperformed the Democrats writ large off the back of a couple of different things, whether that be economic ailments blamed on the Republican Party, whether that be at the face of a weak candidacy of other people in the past, like in 2018, you can totally point to that. Now, this is not really going to be the case. In 2024, we have a decent Republican nominee, and we also have somebody who's going to tout the party line, somebody who is going to ride the Trump coattails, ideally to success. And so when the question is, uh, you know, riding the coattails, that in a state like Arizona or Nevada could be into question because these are purple states when you really look at it. But Ohio is solidified as red. It is about as red as the chances of LeBron James playing with the sun winning a ring. It just won't happen. That being said, of course, there's still like that 5% chance I'm wrong. That, that, that really is dangerous. But like I was saying, there's really no race that there has to be contended with, okay? When you look at Sheridan Brown's record, he's not going to say, well, I have this conservative record, therefore Trump voters ought to vote for me. 
He doesn't have that. He has a bunch of, uh, I would say, less cringe Bernie Sanders takes into the Senate level, and that's about it. He's going to lose for sure. The question is by how much. I'm saying if Trump wins by like 12, I see the Republican beating Brown by maybe eight. And so he's down. It's over. It's a grover for this guy. Now, moving on to, I think, the next closest state, which might be Nevada. Nevada is a very certainly interesting race. Now, this is really the gravy, okay? This is where you want to get into the meat and potatoes, okay? So we see as of the day before my birthday, on May 12th, that actually the Senate by New York Times Siena polls has Rosen and Brown tied. Now, of course, Brown has never shied away from a deep fire in a campaign sense or in a literal sense. I mean, you can see it in his face, okay? We know that explosions and stuff like that does not scare the guy. He will truck through any sort of ties in the polls. He will lead Nevada to victory. I believe it. Why is that the case? Well, when we look at the national polling and even look at this polling, you got to disregard it, folks. This is low IQ. People that say, oh my God, according to a Florida Atlantic University poll, com lab main street research poll with only 494 contestants that this will somehow mean that jackie rosen has an 11 percent lead it's not true throw this in the trash in fact anybody who worked on this project ought to be disbarred from whatever college they're at not using the right term of course because i really don't care the fact is, is that the thing is going red now i'll tell you why here's my main evidentiary piece of course, I can go for the low-hanging fruit, which would include that Trump is leading the state of Nevada over Joseph R. Biden by about 5.3% on a national, national series of polls. That being said, of course, that's not what we're talking about, okay? Because it's pretty clear that as long as the Republican nominee does not backtrack Trump's lead by about 5 percentage points, which again is nigh impossible, I think that they will win. But that being said, we do have another example, and it's going to be the 2022 20, race against uh Adam Laxalt, who's a pretty standard Republican, and Catherine Cortez Masto. Now, as we all know, this chick has a decent amount of fundraising. That being said, it was pretty close. In fact, he lost it by about 0.8%, which is an outperformance of that Trump 2020, sorry, 2022 race. And what's very clear about this, by the way, is that if it was 0.8% of a Democrat win two years ago, the state has moved to the right by about four or five percentage points. And so when you really look into it, the only way that Brown would lose is if Brown, for whatever reason, scares people just vis visually. But what I think is more likely is that, let's say 10% of Trump voters will say, no, I'm voting blue, which just won't happen. And so it's just a logical uh, feat I'm doing here. Not having to look into the stats too much, it's just common sense. That being said, though, we do have Wisconsin to talk about. So if we look at Wisconsin, it's looking really bad for the Democrats. Psych, it's actually really good. Okay, in fact, Hoveday is losing by about 7% on aggregate, which is really sour. In fact, when we look at the mass majority of the polls, they're all anti Uh, But I will contend with this result, in fact, because when you look at it, 2018 was uh, an election where you had a really crappy result with Vukmir, who nobody remembers, by the way, losing by about 11 percentage points. And in 2012, in fact, Baldwin only won by 5.5, which by and large underperforms Obama. And so she's all over the place electorally. So to say confidently that she will do a lot better than Joe Biden, who's probably going to lose the state, is not really going to hold up. And when you look at Eric Hovaday, the guy is photogenic. Again, no homo. But that being said, of course, Eric Hovaday is pretty much the prototype of guy you want running for Wisconsin. This plays into the long game. Of course, the polls now are going to be very different than what they will be in five months. So by Halloween, I will be vindicated. But let's look at one thing. And that's going to have to do with this presidential election. So when we move to the results, Donald Trump against Joe Biden in Wisconsin, he's up ever so slightly. I disagree with these polls. I think he's, in fact, up by about three, just holistically. That being said, do we really see a Hove Day who's going to run in line with Trump? You don't think he can ride the coattails? And why else would that ever not happen? Well, because Tammy Baldwin would somehow do really good. In fact, she's such a good politician, but that just isn't matter factually correct. And so when it comes down to it, I think that Hove Day will win. If the election were held today, of course, I think that Tammy Baldwin wins, but I think Hoveday will hold this one out. The fact is that Donald Trump will win the state by X amount, and that as long as Hoveday runs in line with it, which there doesn't really make sense for this to not be the case, then it seems like a Republican victory. Again, if you're a Republican in 2024, in all the swing states, this includes North Carolina, Nevada, Arizona, you want to run as Trump's shadow. OK, you'll be blacker than a motherfucker. If you're somebody's shadow, but you got to be right on his ass. OK, you got to really copy everything down. And make sure you get all of his voters because he's likely to win all these swing states, which is to say, of course, folks, that if you want to win the Senate at Wisconsin, in Nevada, Arizona, you really want to just copy Trump and just try not to be cringe about it. OK, it's, it's just so true.
if you want to get the crumbs off the table of a big rapper, if you're in the OVO sweatshop, if you want to be on Slaughterhouse, D12, you got to lick some bo- – the point being is that if you want to be in the posse, you got to run in line. I think Hove Day will fit that bill. I think Sam Brown will run that too, and we're going to move on to Michigan. Mind you, this one is all over the place. Alyssa Slotkin is a Jewish uh, representative who is about middle age, so she has a couple of different things going for her and against her. Like, why do I mention that she's Jewish? Well, it seems like a percolating issue, primarily in the Dearborn area, is that a bunch of Arabs and uh, people that are Muslim in faith are, in fact, actually not going to vote for Democrats and might even flip their vote to the opposition just to spite the Democrats because the Democrats have been all over the place. Of course, they're still pro-vaguely Zionism, and so it becomes an issue where Democrats like Alyssa Slotkin, who clearly is part of a tribe, is going to lose support from these fringe parts of the Democratic Party. That being said, of course, she's still relatively moderate, will run in line with Joe Biden, I believe. In fact, might be a little more popular, dare I say. But speaking of which, it could be the reverse of Wisconsin. Now, when we look at Michigan, whereas Trump was winning by only 0.1 in Wisconsin, see that Trump's up over a percentage point as contrasted to the Wisconsin result. And so it becomes an issue of we have Alyssa Slotkin beating Mike Rogers by 1% in the polling. But as you can all see through this polling, it is not recent as of the last month. This aggregate has last been updated in about four weeks. So there's really no issue here with me having a contrary opinion. In fact, when we look at it one way, you'll notice right off the bat, folks, that this adds 39 plus 38. That's nowhere near, in fact, 100% of the vote, which is what you want. Uh, an accurate poll would have maybe Slotkin 47, Rogers 48 or something. But in fact, we have them at less than 40 each. And so that leaves a ton of undecideds. What do we all know about undecideds in this election? They're going to be voting primarily for Trump. And so, of course, the question is, if Trump wins Michigan by 2 or 3%, which I believe will happen, what will happen to Mike Rogers? Mike Rogers has the Trump endorsement that's imminent and beyond this, of course, the preeminent uh, question would be, will he be the shadow to Trump? And I think yes. If you give any politician the chance to climb up the ladder, of course they will run into the shadow of Trump as long as they're not personally beefing. That's the obvious answer. Remember, there's some other things going for the Republican Party in Michigan in 2024. To start off with, for instance, just to wrap this up, we have to consider the fact that the Republican Party, the apparatus in and of itself, had a mini civil war going on a couple months ago. What that brings me to say is that, of course, Things were really in disrespair before the primary really kicked off. And the truth is, is that things will consolidate under whatever Trump performs as in the natural, the actual national election. And so we're going to keep a close eye on that going forward. So moving on to our next day, we have Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a very difficult state to consider because there is a nomenclature that will say that the Republicans have the lead, given the fact that Trump will most likely win the state, but also consider that we do have a strong opponent, okay? Whereas we have Sherrod Brown fans being delusional, doing whippets in the back of their cars at the Arby's parking lot, we do have some Bob Casey bros that are actually vindicated. In fact, when we look at these pollings, which are not the most recent, but are at least within the month, you'll na- you'll actually notice that the Siena College and New York Times bring pretty reasonable results. You see that one poll has Casey winning by five over McCormick, who lost to Oz in the primary, I believe. But when we look at it one way, we also see that McCormick is also losing by only two here. What that's indicative of me to say, of course, is that McCormick is not a great candidate. In fact, he doesn't have charisma from what I can tell. Now and again, we can see some different contrasts and comparisons. Now, we have Trump here by 2.3 winning the race, though we do have a 4% separation when it comes to the polling at the Senate level. This is in line with the fact that Casey is a pretty moderate Democrat for whatever that's worth and will appeal more to the common sense kind of center of Pennsylvania. And so I really do think that he's most likely to win here out of all the Democrats playing defense, if only because we do have state that has historically elected him huge ever since he slaughtered Rick Sam Torum, the beloved Rick Sam Torum in 2006. Okay, so from the age of three to now, about 18 years of pure domination will be continued, uh, at least in my lifetime, for Bob Casey Jr. Now, Arizona is the last state. Obviously, I live here, so I have the strongest opinion about it. We will consult the polls. So consulting the polls, we have a couple of different results we can parse through, and it'll take some nuance to really understand what we're looking at here. So as of two weeks ago, we have Kerry Lake losing by three to Ruben Gallego, who's a left of center Democrat very, very close in line with Bernie Sanders, low key. But we do have another poll, which is more dubious. In fact, we see Gallego up by 13. Now, even more recently, about a week after that, we have Gallego up by 10. And so it's looking really pessimistic looking at that paradigm. But we also have another set of polls. We see Gallego up by about 8, 7, 13, etc. 
So it's not the greatest results for Carrie Lake, but we will see shor shortly how the national polarization of politics really affects this race, as I believe that in the future, Gallegos' lead that I think is very real right now will atrophy with time. That being said, of course, we do have a contentious election at the national level. Now, Nevada is more red than Arizona. That being said, I do believe that Trump's 4.1 lead in Arizona is tried and true. That being said, of course, does Kerry Lake run behind that total is completely up in the air because Kerry Lake has been tarred and feathered over the pro-life position she's had in the light of the Supreme Court ruling, which has this bizarre enforcement mechanism. But it's certain that that has totally dinged her politically. In fact, it looks like you kicked a guy in the balls before running a marathon. And so it's very dubious he actually wins. But that being said, when we extend this analogy to carry, it's a little less severe than that, okay? Things are really negative for the Democrats writ large. Of course, we have a negative economy in the state of Arizona. We do see that Carrie Lake almost did win in 2022, especially given the fact that there were some shenanigans, lines and uh, Republican voters that wanted to vote that could not get their situation remedied in time to get their ballots in for election day. So there is a myriad of reasons as to believe that actually Carrie Lake is low key a better candidate than the paper would produce. That being said, of course, I do think that she will lead a loss right now. The issue is, of course, that if Trump's winning the state by four and by election time, he wins it by two or three. The truth is, is that Carrie Lake is behind him by, I think I'm guessing right now as of like a like the second, about five to seven percentage points. And so it's really asking, will Trump win Arizona by more than five? Because if he does, then I think she does win. Because she is really doing the Lalo strategy of running in Trump's shadow to really get all of his votes. That being said, though, the only problem with her is that with a lot of these clean cut politicians is that like, let's say an Adam Laxalt, he'll get all the Trump support, plus some bur suburban moms that think that Trump is a little out there. Whereas with Carrie Lake, despite being a good speaker and above average looking, she loses all of the Karen vote. She loses all of the suburban externality vote that you otherwise would have, would have expected an anchor from Phoenix getting. And so it's looking like she's going to get all the Trump vote minus a couple percentage points, but virtually no other support outside of Trump. And so when you look at it that way, it's not looking good. That being said, some things will change. For instance, Ruben Gallego's record will become more obvious to people. Uh, they will uh, chastise him for leaving his wife that was nine months pregnant, divorcing her. We have another issue where he's more closely aligned with uh, Bernie Sanders than he is with uh, Joe Biden. Now, we saw David Garcia, I believe, run against uh, Gavin, sorry, no, Doug Ducey, great, the great Doug Ducey in 2018 as a Bernie bro progressive and got destroyed. And so it's evident that maybe if that were to happen at the national level, that people will see that Carrie Lake is the only reasonable option. That being said, right now, she is poised to lose. And that's really unfortunate when you look at it, because if you would have asked anybody with a brain six months ago, they probably would have said that uh, Wisconsin would have gone blue, Nevada would have gone blue, uh, Michigan would have gone blue, or anything of the sort. But in fact, I think that the states that will go notably blue in this year will be Pennsylvania and Arizona. I think Arizona is, again, almost 50-50. But right now, I would say it's a 60-40 pro-Democrat, just because of the abortion thing, by and large, and the fact that Kerry does not engender support among anybody outside of the Trump camp. And the Trump camp is barely big enough in, in and of itself to sustain a win at the state level for Arizona. That being said, I will leave you with this. 55 Republican seats, 45 Democratic seats. Comment down below what you think. If you disagree with me, like if you liked my prediction. Tell me in the comments below if you disagree with me. Again, I'm a pretty smart guy, but maybe you can argue with me, okay? I want to be a lawyer, but maybe I'll lose. And by the way, I waited until after the video for the, for the hot Cheetos, okay? So hopefully this came out a little bit better. And we'll see y'all in the comment sections. Adios.